good morning everyone. Happy Sabbath. You know, I'll tell you, you guys are spoiled here. Sorry to have to tell you that, but you are. You've got a great pianist over there on the jingles. And at any time you want to move to a warmer climate, you just come to Florida and we'll, we'll work out all the details. Ed. What a blessing, boy. I... <laughs> What a treat. That was a real treat. You know, uh, of course, it's always great to be here, and uh, it's a real, real privilege to uh, study, study God's Word this morning. Um, I'm going to try my best to stand up here today. I really prefer down there, but... Um, the lights apparently are real good for the camera and so I'm gonna try to stay up here but if I start to nudge and you know get a little bit close and end up down there you'll understand that I just succumbed to the temptation it was just too much so uh, <laughs> like to open up this morning with Psalms 91 um, beautiful passage Psalms 91, uh, verses 1 to 4. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And of course, the word Almighty there is El Shaddai. Um, the mighty, tender one, El Shaddai. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. I'm sure Martin Luther understood that when he wrote, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You know, at our uh, property back there where we have our church, we're very fortunate because there's all kinds of wild animals that go traipsing through the property. And uh, we've had a bear we had a cougar, we have snakes, they stay, they don't just, you know, mosey on through. The snakes remain. Uh, we've had armadillos, we've had deer, uh, just all kinds of animals on our property. And um, my favorite though are the turkeys. Uh, at this time of year, you know, um, We'll see some turkeys come out. A little bit, probably about a month ahead, we'll start seeing them. And invariably, there will be a mother, and then there will be a bunch of little ones just, you know, just squeaking along. And I love, I love the picture, because every time I pull into the parking area, it's grass, but I'll pull into the yard and the turkeys, if the little turkeys are away from mother, as soon as I pull in and they hear that noise, you know what the little turkeys do? They head straight to mama, straight to mama and they kind of huddle right underneath her feathers. And it's so precious, <laughs> it's so precious to see these little ones. And David understood that he was a little baby turkey. And he said, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. The last part of that passage, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You know, for David as a warrior, his shield was the distance between life and death. 
If he had his shield, he was protected, he was safe, he was secure, he was at peace. Even though he could be facing a terribly mighty Philistine army, But it was that shield that made all the difference. And you know, folk, I, I'm just so thankful today. Because as Ephesians 4 talks about, there would come a time, and let's look at that real quickly, where Paul talked about the fact that there would be every wind of doctrine blowing out there. And folk... There's every wind of doctrine blowing out there today. Verse 14 of Ephesians 4, Paul said that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Folk, David said that God's truth is our shield. It is our only protection at this hour of earth's history. And, you know... Every week, it seems like, if it's not one false teaching, it's another false teaching. And people are just falling, and, you know, we talk about that book, The Great Controversy, and indeed, that's what we are in, is a great controversy. And, folk, it's a battleground. We're on a battlefield. That's what we're on today. It's a battlefield. And in a battle, in a war, there's always casualties. People fall away. People die. People get, they get killed. Well, folk, if we don't have our shield, if we don't have our shield each and every day, folk, we're going to get blown away too. We're going to get blown away. So make sure, make sure. You know, I tell people the greatest temptation that I have as a, as a pastor and sending literature all over the world, my greatest temptation is to get too busy. It's my greatest temptation. To think that I can go out to start my day without spending time arming myself with the Word of God. It's my greatest temptation. To get so busy. That's what happened to David when he fell there in 2 Samuel chapter 11 or 12 with Bathsheba and then killed her husband. You know, people say, well, you know, his sin was, was the adultery. Well, yeah, that was the culmination. His sin was he started depending upon himself. And he thought, I don't need God. Folk, if we, if we get that idea in our heads, we better throw it out immediately and establish, establish a daily devotion time in the morning. It's not about having, you know, I had some people tell me, well, I have my devotion time just before bed. Big deal. Are you going to battle when you go to sleep? No, you're going to go to battle. The, every day is a battle because the devil's after us. So we've got to arm ourselves, not at night. We've got to arm ourselves in the morning. We've got to put on, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, the whole armor. We've got to have scripture verses in our minds to meet the devil. So I'm very grateful this morning. Seek ye first. Seek ye first, Jim, the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So, so important. So important to arm ourselves arm ourselves. 
Well, this morning I want to look at something with you. It's called the Catholic Trinity versus the Biblical Godhead. You know, 22 years ago, when I first started out, it's really amazing how that happened. When we started our ministry in 1995, Charles Wheeling, the uh, man from Alabama with, I don't remember the name of his ministry, but he sent me a folder, it was about that thick, probably three to four inches thick. And he said, brother, he said, you need to read this material as you start your ministry. Well, I read about the first five pages and it became very clear that if I embraced what was in that binder, I wouldn't have a ministry. So I wrote back, I closed it up and I threw the binder into the circular file, complete. And I wrote him a note and I said, uh, I said, Mr. Wheeling, if I accept what is in this book, I would cease to be a minister I would cease to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I would cease to be a Christian. I said, I'm not interested. And excuse my English, but I said, I'm not interested in your garbage. Because that's what it was. I wouldn't be here today. I would be dead. Because I would have no reason to live if I embraced what was in that binder. What an assault on Seventh-day Adventism from Charles Wheeling. Well, 22 years ago, a man in Ohio told me, he said, the Father has told me that he has chosen you to tell the world that the Father has a Son created at a point in eternity and the Holy Spirit is not a person in his own right, but is the Spirit of the Father and his Son. And the man said, and I will give you all the money you need to declare this to the world. Now, folk, let me tell you, when you work independently in business and you make money, that's one thing and that's awesome. But I'm going to tell you, when you are a pastor, one of the carrots that's dangled before you is that paycheck. It's that, it's that money. And this guy knew it. He knew it. I had another guy who told me something similar. He said, I've got a check here for $20,000, but you've got to stop saying this. And I said, you know what? Keep your $20,000. I will continue to tell the truth of God's word. Folk, that is a huge temptation, and it's why, it's why, and I'm sorry, but I don't pull any punches, so if you don't like it, I've warned you ahead of time, and there's a door, and you don't have to listen to me the rest of the day. Folk, I'm not going to pull any punches, but the Adventist ministry today is being strangled by their paycheck. They won't tell the truth because they, if they do, they know they'll lose their paycheck. So they don't tell the truth. So that man told me, he said, Bill, I'll give you all the money I've got. And he had a lot. My response to him was the heavenly trio desire that I preach the three angels messages to the world. And so I will. You can keep your money. Well, folks, that was in 1995. Decades later, this idea of the Trinity and the Godhead continues to perplex people and lead thousands of people astray. Let's go to the sources and find out the truth in contrast to Catholic falsehood. You know, I always go by the proof is in the pudding, if you want to know what somebody believes, you go to their sources. You go and read what they say. It's pretty simple. So, I went to some Catholic uh, books. This is what the Catholic Church teaches on the Trinity. And you see, 
if you believe that. Okay, it's pretty simple. In Catholic theology, we understand the persons of the Blessed Trinity subsisting within the inner life of God to be truly distinct relationally, but not as a matter of essence or nature. Each of the three persons in the Godhead possesses the same eternal and infinite divine nature. Thus, they are the one true God in essence or nature, not three gods. Yet, they are truly distinct in their relations to each other. As we will see, Catholics do not believe the persons in the Godhead are eternal. In order to understand the concept of person in God, we have to understand its foundation in the processions and relations within the inner life of God. And the Council of Florence, 1338 to 1445, can help us in this regard. So this is what the Council of Florence declared as far as the Catholic Church is teaching on the Trinity. The Council's definitions concerning the Trinity are really as easy as one, two, three, four. It taught there's one nature in God that there are two processions, three persons and four relations that constitute the Blessed Trinity. The Son proceeds from the Father, which means that there's a Father and the Son came out from the Father. That's that's pretty simple. And folk, because the idea of the Godhead, if any one of us says we understand it, we're a liar. You know, we're a liar. Because there are things in the Godhead that no human being will ever understand. Okay? So I'm going to try to make this as simple, as simple as possible. Okay, so the Son comes out from the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. These are the two processions in God, and these are foundational to the four relations that constitute the three persons in God. These are those four eternal relations in God. So, Catholic Church right here, and I will give you the document on the next slide, I believe. Yeah. They're saying that there are three persons. However, they're saying that the Son does not have life in himself, is not an eternal being, and he comes out from the Father. And that the Holy Spirit is not an eternal being, but He comes out from the Father and the Son. Okay? Let's go on. The Father actively and eternally generates the Son, constituting the person of God the Father. The Son is passively generated of the Father, which constitutes the person of the Son. The Father and the Son act actively spirate the Holy Spirit in the one relation within the inner life of God that does not constitute a person. It does not do so because the Father and Son are already constituted as persons in relation to each other in the first two relations. That's why CCC teaches the second person of the Blessed Trinity is Son only in relation to His Father. The Holy Spirit is passively spirated of the Father and Son, constituting the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, looking at those, summarizing that, I don't believe that. It's, Lisa, this study this morning, there are, there are issues, there are words that are used. It's not simple. So I'm, I'm going to try to say what I'm hearing, what they just said. 
And that was the father has always been the son at some point long ago came out from the father. And the Holy Spirit at some point in time came out from the father and the son. Okay? So that's what I'm hearing that the Catholic Church believes on the Trinity. Now this is from the Council of Nicaea of 325. It says this, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. So Christ is created at some point in time. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial to the Father by whom all things were made. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of all life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and Son is to be adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. So, summarizing it, the Father is over all. The Son was born of the Father. Therefore, the Son is a created being. The Holy Spirit is not a person. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, folk, in Catholic understanding, this is the very center of their belief system, which I think is so ridiculous. And when Adventists start nitpicking about the Godhead and the Trinity, and making it such a, a, an important issue. Well, folk, it's not. What's important is, am I allowing Jesus to be the master of my heart every day? Amen. Am I submitting my will to him? You know, years ago in Arkansas, I gave a sermon on Daniel 11, and when the sermon got over, I had prayed and as I was rising up from my, from my knees, I saw a pair of tennis shoes right by my briefcase. And I thought, where did those tennis shoes come from? Well, as I'm getting up off my knees, I realize that those tennis shoes are connected to ankles that are connected to knees, <laughs> connected to a torso, and there's a man standing right there. And I'm thinking to myself, Boy, he got up here fast. I looked at him and I said, well, good evening, sir. How are you? And he said, what do you believe on the Trinity? <laughs> so I told him very briefly what I believed. And then I said, now I have a question for you. Is Jesus Christ the master of your life? Are you in submission to his will in your life every day? You know what? Till I asked that question, he and I were looking eye to eye at each other. As soon as I asked that question, he went like this. And he mumbled something. It became very clear to me, folks, that he was using a belief to make himself feel religious. It doesn't work. And there's a lot of people out there today that are using the Godhead, Yahweh, feast days, churches Babylon, church, you can only be saved in the church. They're, they're using Wednesday crucifixion, they're using all these ideas to make themselves feel religious. And folk, the only thing that can make us feel religious is getting on our knees and saying, Jesus, 
I need you in my life today. I need your power in my life. And then he will come in and um, we'll know that we have an experience with the Lord. There really is no question over the position of the Father in the Godhead. The place of the Son of God and the Holy Spirit are where the questions come in. The Catholic Trinity teaches that Christ was born of the Father, created at some point in the past, and is not the eternal Son of God. The Holy Spirit, according to the Catholic Trini Trinity doctrine, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. He does not have life in Himself, but receives it from the Father and the Son. Now, do we believe in the Catholic Trinity? No, no we don't. We don't. Uh, Mark Finley wrote a book called Studying Together. And Mark Finley wrote in this book, he said that we have some doctrinal beliefs in common with Roman Catholics. Now the very first one that he mentioned in his book was the Godhead. Do you believe that? No. no. We don't agree on the Godhead. The virgin birth, although not the immaculate conception, and then the necessity of obeying God, which is quite interesting because Rome is trying to destroy the Ten Commandments. So, have a hard time with that. Mark Finley's dead wrong, folks. He's dead wrong. A Seventh-day Adventist does not believe that Christ was created. A Seventh-day Adventist believes that Christ has always been from all eternity. You know, I was reading this morning in Revelation chapter 1, and I don't think I mentioned this passage uh, a little bit later, but notice Revelation 1 for a minute. Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 11. It says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Who did Jesus declare himself to be? He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning, I am the first, and I am the end. I'm the last. Folk, now I need this to be real simple, but what I hear Jesus declaring in Revelation chapter 1 is, I am the beginning. I don't have a beginning. I am the beginning. I've always been. Always. And I will always be. Now, praise the Lord this morning, folks, because the one who has always been from eternity and who will always be loved you and me so much that he came to this revolting world and died because he wanted us to know how much he loved us. Now, that, that is, that's good news. That's good news, folk. The eternal one died to let me know I'm special and that you're special. 
A Seventh-day Adventist does not believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. We don't believe that. A Seventh-day Adventist believes the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And that's what we believe. Who has life in himself and does not receive life from the Father and the Son. Now, folk, let, let me just, let's clarify something. There is not anything in our visible world whereby we can illustrate three eternal beings in the Godhead so closely united together that they're one. There is nothing that we can use to explain that. Why? Because we are creatures, fallen, sinful beings, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal beings. Now how do you connect those two things? You don't. So let's, not, let's quit trying to. You know, in Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, Notice what the Bible says. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Folk, when the Bible teaches us something as it is about the Godhead, all we can do is simply say, Lord, you've said that. I accept what you say. I don't understand it. And no human being does. Amen. Was Christ a created being? Well, Let's notice some Bible passages and then we'll look at some Ellen White statements that show clearly Jesus was not created. Isaiah 9 verse 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, what's the name of this child? that was to be born in this world. The Bible says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Micah 5 2 says, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So Micah 5 2 says, There will be a child born in the little town of Bethlehem Ephratah, who will be a ruler whose goings forth are from eternity, from eternity. John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made in Him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1 is very clear that in Christ there was life. He didn't get it from anybody. It was his. It was his. John 8, 56 to 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. 
Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. I am. I've always been. I will always be. And folk, in the final analysis, the man who made that statement, and his name was Jesus, he was either, now let's get it real clear, he was either an insane lunatic, or he was the eternal Son of God. Now there's no middle ground with that. It was either this one or this one. We already read Revelation chapter 1. Notice Ellen White. Desire of Ages 469 and 470. With solemn dignity Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. Wow! He had announced himself to be the self-existent one he who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 296 and 297. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, 4. It's not physical life that is here specified, but immortality. The life which is exclusively the property of of God. The Word who was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something which each individual receives. It's not eternal or immortal. For God the life giver takes it again. Man has no control over his life. But the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. I lay it down of myself, he said. In him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. Folk, Jesus didn't get life from anybody because he was life. In him was life, original, he didn't borrow it from anybody. He didn't derive it from another source. He had life in himself from all eternity. All eternity. Well, and somebody comes along and says, Oh, but, but that's a compilation. That's a compilation. Ellen White didn't write that. That was something that was compiled. Folk, that's a bunch of baloney. Ellen White did write that. Sure, First Selected Messages is a compilation. It's a compilation of what she said. What she said. So if somebody discredits what Ellen White said by saying, well, she didn't write... Well, if somebody says that to you, you are listening to the omega of apostasy. That's what you're listening to. And we're going to look at that further this afternoon. Folk, don't let anybody tell you that Ellen White didn't write certain things. Do you know where that came from? That came from a man named John Harvey Kellogg. And John Harvey Kellogg was the man who brought the alpha of deadly heresies into Seventh-day Adventism. 
Don't let anybody play that game with you. The Catholic Trinity on Christ, different from the Adventist Godhead, the Catholic Trinity is off from Scripture and Seventh-day Adventism on the Godhead. Their understanding of Christ as coming forth from the Father is dead wrong. Christ is the eternal Son of God in His own right. The Holy Spirit within the Catholic Trinity is also dead wrong. What does the Bible teach about the Holy Spirit? Well, Hebrews 9 verse 14. The Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Paul referred to the Holy Spirit as eternal. But when does eternal begin? When does eternal end? It doesn't, does it? So the Apostle Paul said the Holy Spirit is eternal. Therefore the Holy Spirit is God, is divinity. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but to who? God. To God. In verse 3, Peter said that Ananias lied to the Holy Ghost. In verse 4, Peter said, Ananias, you've lied to God. In the mind of the Apostle Peter, to lie to, to the Holy Ghost was lying to God. Now just one other passage. Psalms 139. Very interesting passage. Psalms 139. And there's so many more, folks. So many more. Psalms 139, verse 7 and 8. It says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. The Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit is everywhere. He's everywhere. Now are you everywhere? No, you're not. Why aren't you? Because you're not God. The fact that the Holy Spirit can be here and can be in the Philippines and in South Africa and in Russia all at the same time says he's divine. He's divine. Special Testimonies, Series B, number 7, page 62 and 63. The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. Did you hear that? Folk, <laughs> You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, the Godhead is like, um, let's see, there's, there's water, and there's uh, snow, and there's ice. And that's how the, the Godhead is. No, it's not. You can't define the Godhead by anything 
that we can see. You can't. And that's what Ellen White just said. The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifest. The Word of God declares Him to be the expressed image of His person. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father, the Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven, is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. You know what I think in, in the final analysis? That's the real issue. We can't understand the three persons of the Godhead so closely united together the Bible says they're one. We can't understand that. But what we can understand is that we can cooperate with these living beings, these living persons. We can submit our rebellious mind and will and we can say, take over my life. Live out your life within me. O oh, Jesus, King of Kings. That we can do. And folk, we can understand and we can experience the power of God that enables us to live a life of obedience. That we can experience and that we can understand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What a wonderful experience. Manuscript 101, Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of His pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. Somebody says to you, so... When did you come into existence? Well, you'd say, I was born on such and such a date. Ellen White says that Christ carries us back through dateless ages. He can't say, I was born March 8, 1957. I can, but he can't. He can't say, I was born October 22 of 1840. No. No, you can't put a date on when Christ came into existence because He's always been. The Father's always been. The Son has always been. And the Holy Spirit has too. Always. He to whose voice the Jews were then listening had been with God as one brought up with Him. He was equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal, self-existent Son. Manuscript 101, 1897. We need to realize, Ellen White wrote Manuscript 20, 1906. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. 
Manuscript 66, 1899. The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a personality, else he could not bear witness to our spirits, and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of man. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. The Prince of the Power of Evil, Special Testimony Series A, number 10, page 37. The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. We are to cooperate, and here's where we come in. We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these powers will work through us making us workers together with God. Wow. God will step down through the Holy Spirit and his angels and he will dwell with you and me. Praise God this morning. Praise God. From Catholic sources in summation, from Catholic sources and inspiration, it's very clear that the two are very, very different. While this is important to see the difference, it is of even greater importance that we live in submission to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and allow the fruits of the Spirit to be revealed in us. Without this manifestation, we will not be in the kingdom of God. Folk, I hope that that was somewhat simple. Uh, that was my hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for what your word has revealed. We are awed and we are humbled to recognize that you are so much bigger, so much more powerful than we could ever dream. Please save us from ourselves and stepping on forbidden ground and thinking that we can totally grasp the three heavenly persons in the Godhead. I just pray, Lord, that you'd help each one of us to submit that you could live out your life within us today. In Jesus' name, amen.